Hi everyone and welcome to your ATAR music class. We're talking about romanticism in music so we're moving away from the classical period and into the romantic period with this. Uh, this lesson is going to be a bit more of a lecture than normal um, so sit down, write out some notes, watch the video all the way through for the first time in its full entirety and then go and watch it again, pause it, take notes and continue on with the work. So in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at the Romantic period using the idea format. So identify, define, explain, and apply or analyze. And it's just one kind of format that you can use during your response tasks in your CHA test and in exams as well. So it looks like we're going to identify what the Romantic period is and the time period that it occurred. We'll define Romanticism in relation to the music and the arts explain the main political, social and philosophical ideas present during the 19th century and apply the music of the 19th century, apply this to the music of the 19th century making reference to specific works of Western art music. Your success criteria is to produce a working definition of Romanticism and what I mean by a working definition is that it can change. You're allowed to adjust it as we go through this course of work and come up with an idea, one or two sentences that you can put at the top of your CHA tests that define Romanticism and what it looks like in music. And then we'll look at the philosophies of the movement and how it's reflected in the music making of the 19th century. A quick word on grammar though. Um, so when we're referring to a period of time or an era, we always want to be using a capital letter as it is a proper noun. So when we talk about the classical era or the Romantic period, Classical has to have a capital C, Romantic has to have a capital R. But when you're referring to this as a political or an artistic movement, we use the lowercase. So Romanticism would have a lowercase r. Nationalism, which comes up a lot, a lot would have a lowercase n. When writing these numbers, um, when writing numbers just in general, you should always be writing numbers in full up to the, about the number 10. So if you're writing nine, you write N-I-N-E. When we're writing in terms of centuries, always write the word out. So 20th century is spelt out rather than two zero with a T-H. When you're referring to a style, make sure that you um, spell out the words, so 18th century, and use a hyphen as well. So if we're talking about 18th century music as a style of music, so the classical period, then we're going to be using a hyphen to define that because it's an adjective. So looking at the Romantic period for this lesson. Um, romantic period is about 1820 to 1900, follows the classical period. But remember that there is no exact date for the end of one era to the other. Composers didn't just wake up and decide to write in a brand new style. There was always this transition period. And we think about the composer that transitioned from the classical to the Romantic period as being Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven was a really, really important figure towards the end of his career. And during the time of the Napoleonic Wars, he was writing a lot of music that helped transition us from the classical to the Romantic period as well. Lots of really important composers during the Romantic period. Schumann, Mahler, Tchaikovsky, Brahms are just a few. And we'll have a look at them as we go along as well. The Romantic period was an, this explosion, I would say, of music and composers. So let's have a look at what Romanticism actually is. It can be defined as a movement in the arts and literature that emphasized inspiration, subjectivity, nature, and the importance of the individual. So Romanticism, really, if we think about it in terms of our dichotomies, so our battles between two forces, between form and feeling, then the Romanticism is on the feeling side. It rejects a lot of the ideals of classical music, so order, symmetry and form, and it values the idea of the natural world, it idealized the life of the common man, and rebelled against social conventions, and stressed the importance of the emotional in art. As we continue through this lesson, you need to keep a graphic organizer in Connect to make sure you compare and contrast the Romantic and the Classical eras. It was a big, big fundamental shift in the way of thinking and we see that in society and what was happening at the time. So the Romanticism, uh, the Romantic period, so that 1820 to 1900, 
was a result of quite a revolting time. So the Romantic period was a time of social and political upheaval. There were many changes to society and revolutions changed the world and the philosophies of different cultures. Your two main ones were the French Revolution and the first Industrial Revolution. So the French Revolution really fundamentally changed the political and social landscape of Europe. In France, uh, French revolutionaries were led by Napoleon and overthrew the monarchy and took control of the government. It ended the French monarchy and removed some of the power from the Catholic Church at the time. Within that, what you had previously was a monarchy or an aristocracy, and the people of France were considered subjects or belonging to that king, belonging to that lord. With the French Revolution and the new ideas, you have this development of the idea of nationhood, so people actually belonging to a nation, belonging to a group and to a country, and then you get the idea of citizenship from that as well. During the Napoleonic Wars, so the French Revolution happened, Napoleon took down the government and then decided that he wanted to be emperor of France. Um, this didn't set well with many people, including Beethoven, who famously wrote a symphony about Napoleon and then changed it to the Heroic Symphony and not the Napoleonic Symphony. And Napoleon wasn't settled with just France. He wanted to, he had the idea of a unified Europe which we see today in the EU, but at the time it was very much separate countries, separate empires from previously. So your Holy Roman Empire, uh, Empire and all that sort of stuff. So Napoleon set out on his Napoleonic Wars, so about 1803 to 1815. Ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, you did see a spread across Europe of the ideas though that came from the French Revolution. So the ideas of democracy, um, reducing the church's power and limiting monarch power. And the, uh, the first time you had a Europe that could see really the idea of freedom for all citizens, the idea of nationhood, of liberty, that previously wasn't there because we had this aristocracy and we had this um, monarchy that looked after its subjects as though they owned them. So you had a massive change in the way that society was shaped. And then also the Industrial Revolution was occurring at about the same time. So from about 1716 to 1820, again, there are no clear dates for this one. Uh, new technologies began to transform the economy from a chiefly rural agrarian economy to an urban one. We see the enrichment of the middle class, but reducing the power of the aristocracy and worsening conditions for the poor. Before this, a lot of things were handmade. You had a lot of artisans that would create furniture, would be creating clothing and that sort of thing. But with the development of new technologies, a lot of those handmade jobs went away. So you had a lot of low income workers that could no longer create an income and they went into factories and into the into urban society. Mass production left, led to cheaper goods, increasing the ease of access to materials and musical instruments creating a class of people with a desire for music and entertaining in their own homes. Music was no longer the symbol status for the aristocracy, but was accessible for the common man, and a more disposable income led to the creation of concert venues where bigger was better. So your French Revolution created the idea of nationhood, created the idea of citizens who all deserved equal rights and liberty and freedom. The Industrial Revolution gave money to this middle class. We had a group that had better income and better standards of living, and so wanted more from that as well. And music and the arts was a way that they could spend some of this disposable income that we saw as well. How this looks like in the arts movements. So it was a time of many isms. Ism being a suffix, the formation of nouns that denote principles, characteristics, or doctrines. So if you stick ism on the end of something, then it's a collection of ideas. So we had nationalism and exoticism. With the rise of the idea of a nation and nationhood, composers created music with a more specific national identity. They drew upon folk songs, dances, legends, and histories from their own homelands, in contrast with the classical period, which had a more universal style. So these composers really looked at what it was to be 
French or what it was to be German and what it was to be Czech um, and wrote within that style and said and really took ownership of their own music whereas before you had a more universal style so the big center of music during the classical period was Austria and Austria had that kind of control over what classical music sounded like Mozart was Austrian um, so you had that real neat tidy style you had a focus on national identities and this led to composers to draw musical language from exotic lands particularly from Asian countries and the newly founded Americas you had this idea that if we looked at music as a way of representing a culture then we could also show Japan through music we could also show China through music granted this is a very Western point of view and a very westernized version of what Japanese and Chinese music sounds like so it was basically pentatonic scales and so your big composers like Puccini's Madame Butterfly has a lot of this in it as well you have the idea of individualism and subjectivity so romantic composers worked to create an individual style of composition and placed emphasis on self-expression and individuality of style universe of feelings was explored by romantic composers and the epic of the individual or the hero became a framework for many composers struggling with their own identities and desire for expression developments in society and the dismantling of the aristocracy meant that composers had greater freedom over their compositions writing for the general public and not some benefactor or a duke so with the removal of the aristocracy particularly during the french revolution and napoleonic wars you didn't have someone that paid a composer to be a live-in artist you didn't have someone who paid for them to write a symphony because their guests are coming or pay for them to write an opera because you're bored you had this development of the idea that an artist could have some control over their own work that they were supported by the people the people paid to attend concert halls and so they wrote for the people they had more control over their music because they weren't controlled by an aristocracy their income didn't rely upon it so from that you get a wider range of styles and of musical um, musical compositions during this time as well you have the idea of naturalism as well so with the emphasis on homelands composers increasingly compose works that depict elements of nature from the flow of a river to a wild horseback ride on a stormy night composers took their surroundings as inspiration there are many other things going on at this time these are your big points that we need to touch on particularly for your course now that we know kind of what's happening at the time of the romantic period or just before the romantic period with the destruction of the aristocracy big changes and shifts in society we'll have a look at the elements of music and how that's changed in the romantic era so during the romantic period you have people that are struggling and, and really wanting to develop richer sounds more emotional society um, so you have romantic composers reveling in rich sounds using tarbra to attain a variety of moods and atmospheres you have an expanded orchestra including what were auxiliary instruments like the bass clarinet and the cor anglais and piccolo now becoming quite common in that orchestra uh, improvements in the construction of instruments as well allowed your wind, woodwind section to perform more flexibly and accurately this led to what we call idiomatic writing or writing that is really well written for that instrument and relies on the tonal qualities of that instrument you have a lot of solo writing in the wind section at the same time your orchestra has got bigger um, we increase the size of the orchestra to over 100 musicians versus your kind of your 30 to 60 in the classical period and particularly the brass and percussion sections grew it gave your composers a wider variety of sounds and they experimented with new techniques to create this this variety of sound in there as well during this time with greater techniques harder music all this sort of stuff performers had to have a higher level of technical virtuosity a lot of composers also felt really confined by the nature of classical harmony that tonal really structured harmony and there was a more prominent use of chromatic harmony so that is using chords that contains note not found within the prevailing scale the crunchy chords added color and motion to romantic music and dissonant chords were used ooh, 
were used more freely and deliberately, postponing the resolution of a phrase. So we always talk about music as being this idea behind, again, a dichotomy between tension and resolution or uh, dissonance and consonance. The longer that you can avoid the consonants, the longer you can avoid resolving something, the more tension you can build up in a piece and the more your audience feels that tension. We, and through the use of chromatic chords, that's how our, our romantic composers did that. You also had more rapid med modulations and less emphasis on key relationships with a greater freedom. So your tonic is not as clear as it is in classical music. You think back to your Mozart symphony, everything you knew when it relaxed. You could hear that tonic return or you could hear the modulation to the dominant. Within classical, within romantic music, keys change quite rapidly. You no longer have a single mood or a single key being the center of a movement. The composers just freely modulated quite often within bounds of tonal harmony, like there is some relationships, but you could go to the relative minor of the subdominant straight away and it wouldn't be an issue. You also have an increase with the size of orchestras. You have an increase on the emphasis of melody and thematic transformation, particularly the E-Day fix. So a melody or a motif would always would represent a character or an idea and it would return at different points of the symphony transformed by changes in dynamics, orchestration, or rhythms, and it reflects the ongoing story. Uh, it's used to unify grand works, kind of like a hook or an earworm. As soon as you hear it, you know where you are in the story. It gives audiences something to listen to and listen out for as well as we go. During the Romantic era, really bigger was better. Um, so you had a greater range of dynamics, be mainly because of the improvement of our instruments and larger orchestras. With that middle class, you had larger concert halls that required instruments to be louder and could cast across those concert halls. You also had the use of a sharp contrast of dynamics and the frequent use of gradual changes. So rather than the classical period where everything was kind of uniform and symmetrical, you could have very, very sharp contrast and it happens a lot in your Tchaikovsky symphony as well. Developments of instruments means that there was greater range of pitch um, and a greater range of instruments also meant that. So you had the brilliance of the piccolo up in the top register, everything down to your contrabassoon right at the low, that rumbling sound. And your instruments were no longer just a means to an end. So it's not just giving it to the wind section to carry it in contrast with the strings. Instruments were selected specifically for their tonal color or their expressive qualities at this time. So you think about when we look at uh, Tchaikovsky, the opening of the Tchaikovsky has a clarinet, a viola and a cello playing at the same time. When the flute joins, it's in the lower register. That's really, really important for that mood and that style that he was going for. You also have a greater range of tempo changes in a single movement as performers drew upon expression from the score and a wider use of rubato or robbed time. So stealing from one bar, giving to another, slowing down, speeding up, all this sort of stuff. The result of this is that a, a single movement no longer had a single mood or tempo. It would always fluctuate and it would be more about the emotional ride than it is about the technical brilliance of a composition. And finally, you had new forms. So composers were contradictory. They wrote these massive symphonies, like Mahler got up to about 200 musicians, but you also had miniature compo uh, miniatures composed at the same time. So particularly with that rise of the middle class, there was this thirst and this hunger for music that could be played at the home by amateur musicians. And composers really used this area, this chamber music, to try and experiment with different ideas and develop the concepts that were talked about in Romanticism. They really talked about, they demonstrated their command of intense mood through melody, a few chords, or an unusual tonal colour. Composers often became, I, in my opinion, Romantic chamber music is the best classical music, the best Western art music, because it really captures the ability of a composer to write compelling music in quite a small format. 
we always say that it's harder to explain something in a few words than writing an entire paragraph. And this is very much the same when it comes to chamber music. Uh, in contrast though, composers did work on massive epics. Um, so th during the classical period, your symphony was about 25 minutes. And during the romantic period, some of them got to over two hours. Uh, Wagner's ring cycle certainly takes it as it goes over multiple days. Uh, composers used, so you had these large scale formats and composers used a number of techniques to try and tie it all together. So you had transitional pa passages, you had cyclic forms, so things that would just start, like if you could play the end of one movement, the end of one symphony, and then play the first movement, and it would just sound like it continues on. You also had that melody idea, so the De Fix, or thematic transformation, would tie together this work. So you have a two hour long symphony and you'd hear this melody developed at different times throughout the symphony and you would be that ear worm or that hook that you could hold on to. I think this little quote from Camion sums up the Romantic period really well. So in dealing with an age that so prized individuality, generalizations are especially difficult. The great diversity found in romantic music can best be appreciated, perhaps, by approaching each piece as this composer did, with an open mind and heart. Uh, here, try coming up with a working definition of romanticism. Watch the video again, look at each of the different elements, and then try and put it into one or two sentences that you'd stick at the top of an essay or a CHA test.